so I'm Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Lab. Uh, we usually have a program that is related to art, uh, activism and disruption. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank a lot uh, my partner and collaborators. Uh, first of all, uh, Daniela Silvestrin, that has been the curator for this event. And uh, Claudia Dorfmuller and Kim Foss, that uh, work uh, as project manager at the Disruption Lab. And Tabea Hamper, the press manager. So actually, I would like to ask you to do a little applause for them, because uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, it's really something important always to reward the people that put uh, all their hard work into something that then come out uh, so nice, I would say. And uh, then, of course, I want to thank thanks our funders, the, the Rigir and the Burgemeister from Berlin, uh, Senat Kanzler, City Tax, uh, and especially also Julia Guterrier Paris, uh, that has been helping us a lot in all the managing procedure. And I think also today she will come here. Maybe she's here already. So I think also she deserves a special thank. And then uh, I also want to thank the Friedrich Heber Stiftung that uh, has been working in partnership with us. And especially also uh, Katrin Kluver and Jochen Steinhilber from the Global Policy and Development Department. And then, of course, our partner and cooperation partner, Kunstan Kreuzberg Betanien and the uh, Spectrum, that uh, is this great space uh, in Berlin uh, that uh, is always collaborating with us uh, for uh, the pre-events. Um, for this specific conference, we have also a partnership uh, with the Resistance Studies Network and the Resistance Study Initiative of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And so they have also been really great uh, in uh, uh, spreading the news all over the sea about, uh, uh, over the sea, not all over the sea, about our event. And our media partner, ex-Berliner, Der Freitag and Furterfield. So I would just uh, say briefly two words about uh, our series of events and then I want to probably introduce Daniela Silvestrin that has been curating these specific uh, days. And, um, uh, this is the second event of the Art and Evidence uh, conference series. Uh, it's a conference uh, that uh, started already in June and we conclude uh, in November 2016. And uh, usually with this Art and Evidence series, uh, we want to address uh, topics that are um, revealing facts, uh, exposing misconducts uh, and wrongdoings. So it's also pretty related to the practice of whistleblowing. But at the same time, we also want to address that uh, uh, in the artistic field work and for example question art uh, and knowledge production. So this event is called Ignorance, the power of non-knowledge and uh, for that I really want to thank Daniela again because it was her conceptual proposal. Uh, so I think that she will introduce you better than me what uh, ignorance uh, and no knowledge is about and then of course all our participants that we will have today we will start with the keynote of Matthias Gross. Um, so Daniela has worked with us now for a long time she was already working with me also at the early conceptualization of the Disruption Network Club in 2014 and then in 2015 uh, she was working as a project manager, but we have been also curating together an event already uh, that was the cyborg event in 2015. I don't know if you remember especially the panel about transhumanism that she was moderating and uh, at the moment she is working uh, as curator not only with us but also with the state experience science uh, festival in Berlin and uh, her practice of research explore hybrid artistic uh, practice in the intersection of art and science. So I would say it's also kind of practice-based research because it refers a lot to our art, uh, but also knowledge. Um, so I would say now is your turn <laughs> after this introduction and I thank you again for this contribute at the Disruption Network Club and I hope you will all enjoy these days. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. <clears throat> Thank you for this nice introduction. And uh, yeah, also from my side, a warm welcome. 
uh, to this event. Um, Ignorance, the power of non-knowledge, uh, second event of our art and evidence series. Um, I, as Tatiana said, wanted to quickly give you um, an insight or an introduction into the, the general theme of the event and the reason why I chose it or why I proposed it uh, and thought it was interesting and important to talk about it. Um, so, ignorance was indirectly at the core of several Disruption Network Lab events already, um, mainly in its form as um, created through secrecy and military classification, such as we discussed in the drones event or in several different events that were about whistleblowing, and also in the last event about the um, undersea internet uh, infrastructure. Um, but there are many other forms and other reasons for ignorance that can be either positive or negative. And this in, in this event, we wanted to expand our field of investigation and exploration and to address and explore this growing field of, of study. Um, in a society that is based on the production and the acquisition of knowledge and that regards knowledge as a defining element of its era, it's important to look at the fact that new knowledge always also creates new ignorance. Um, ignorance is an important part uh, and inspiration and driving force for um, both scientific but also artistic research and also um, yeah, inspiring us a lot to actually understand the world that we live in better. At the same time, if knowledge is such an important, has such a big importance in our society, ignorance become, can become a strategic tool for political, economic and other agendas. Um, so, in these two days, what we will discuss under the term of ignorance is um, going beyond and, and, or is much more than what the term normally is, is understood or commonly is understood like. Um, so, we will see that ignorance uh, here will not only mean or refer to remaining voids and gaps in our growing knowledge, and it's also not just uh, mainly about deliberate and willful um, disregard of facts. The first challenge related to ignorance is, um, of course, to become aware of it, and so uh, to turn what uh, the so-called unknown unknowns into known unknowns. And once we become aware of its existence and scope and, and reasons and dynamics, um, ignorance turns into what has been termed non-knowledge, so a kind of well-defined ignorance. And um, these two days are dedicated to uh, the unmaking of ignorance and the exploring of non-knowledge through a variety of contributions um, that will unveil and analyze forms and reasons of ignorance across different fields of research and practice. We will discuss uh, approaches to unmake ignorance. Um, we will see positive and negative aspects of its usefulness. We will ask what really needs to be known. And we will also reflect on ethical questions of responsibility, for example, for willful ignorance. Tomorrow, we will mainly or then especially focus on ignorance as a tool for political and economic agendas in, uh, in a so-called post, in so-called post-truth politics. And um, yeah, especially in the context of current developments in, the, in Europe and uh, also in the US. And then we will also go and see um, ignorance as promoted through the borderless and inscrutable infrastructures of the internet and uh, digital economies. So now I'm happy to uh, introduce and welcome our first keynote speaker, Matthias Gross. Matthias is professor of environmental sociology at the Helmholtz Center for An Environmental Research in Leipzig and at the University of Jena. In his research, he focuses on renewable energy and experiment renewable energy, experiment and innovation, and also on the uh, changing role of civil society in environmental policy. He uh, has contributed and authored several books, and among these are, for example, um, the book Ignorance and Surprise, Science, Society and Ecological Design, that was published with MIT Press. And last year, uh, he published um, and e co-edited uh, the very 
extensive Routledge International Handbook of Ignorance Studies. He will introduce us to the development a little bit of this field of study and also some of the main aspects and questions uh, at the core of it in general and then to, um, in, in relation to his personal research and field of work. To quickly also tell you about the, the rest of the program after the keynote, as usual, we will have a short conversation and Q&A, so the possibility to ask questions to Matthias, then a short break. And after the break, the program will continue with a panel where we will have um, or present experimental approaches and um, ethical and moral considerations in relation to different forms of ignorance. And we will end the program with a screening of the documentary Merchants of Doubt. So now, warm welcome to Matthias. And I hand the mic and word over to him. Okay, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, it's good to be here, I guess. Oh, my computer went off. What happened? I brought a few slides with me. Huh. Not knowing my computer. I cannot turn it on or off with the, with the, with the button here. It broke yesterday, so I found a way to... Um, uh, it's coming. These poor German research institutions they only have old computers for their staff. And this shows here. <coughs> So here's a title. It was made up by you, so I had to kind of work my, my presentation, my preparation here around that uh, t title, because um, indeed, it's an empirically impossible task to know more about what is unknown. Uh, even as a godlike sociological observer, you have difficulties uh, knowing what other people don't know, especially when these people don't even know that they don't know that. So you know that story. That's kind of a, a classical paradox, but there may be other areas that we can talk about, that we can measure, that we can register, and that's something I may have been interested in for quite some time, and that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, I'm going to say a little bit on growth in knowledge, in particular scientific knowledge, because that's my background in scientific uh, science and technology studies. I'm going to say a little bit on how that may be related to risk in the classical sense that you have in, in risk assessments, because in a lot of ways, risk has been an attempt, or risk assessments have been an attempt to make the world more calculable, right? to uh, 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 shun out everything that is unknown and then you use historical data for projecting into the future. And then always the unknown is kicking in and, and make us leaving a mess, right? But that needs to be something, uh, something that needs to be made clear, I believe, to understand why the notion of non-knowledge or ignorance or however you want to call it is gaining in importance and that increasingly so in the 21st century. Um, Another thing that I found interesting when I was invited here, um, uh, I, I learned about this thing called the disruption lab. Now, what is happening in the lab, right? People experiment, uh, most of the time at least, and uh, uh, I think it's really important to understand, and you also said it in your introductory words, that you're using experimental 
um, forms of uh, doing things, of discussing things. So every, everything is being experimentalized these days, or so it seems, but it can be nicely connected also to the unknown in a very strategic way. I'm going to say a little bit on that. And then, uh, number four, number five, I'm going to give you a quick run through some of my research I've been doing the last um, 10 plus years. Uh, chemicals in the ground, where you often know that they're there, but that's about everything you know. And also uh, a few difficult issues when it comes to digging into the depth of the geological underground, some 10 kilometers deep, and uh, uh, also as, as, as part of the German uh, energy event, the German energy turnaround, to get more sources of renewable energies deep in, deep in the deep in the ground, and that is also an undertaking and an engineering undertaking where a lot of unknowns are involved. It's very difficult to get the actors involved talk about what they're doing in these terms, and they don't have to, but we have analytical, we're starting to have analytical ways of, uh, um, of, of framing these utterances, etc. And as an outlook, I'm going to give you a few hints on where we may want to discuss the whole issue a little further. Um, not knowing in everyday life, so that's kind of the overall topic of the event here, and uh, you've learned about secrets and military secrets in the past here, and that is probably the most well-known uh, debate when it comes, to, when it comes to, to ignorance, right? And for quite some time, uh, people thought and scientists thought that being able to keep secrets is also what only human beings can. Right? So you know it, for those of you who have little kids, they have quite problems keeping secrets for themselves. So it's kind of a, a, a thing that people learn while they socialize and, and, uh, and grow up and turn into social beings in a sociological sense. Right? By now, there may be animals out there who also can keep secrets or what we render uh, keeping secrets. But for a long time, keeping secret was something uh, uh, meant in a very positive way because it, it was an indication of, of being human. Of course, there's the spread of ignorance in the sense of wrong knowledge, of, of knowledge gaps, so that people, journalists, etc., cannot even make sense of what is being uh, done, what is being decided upon. You know these stories, and that is kind of the traditional research on the unknown. Right? Very often, people pretend not to know something so they can. Uh, cannot be sued or something like that. Right? So if you can prove properly that you were not able to know something, um, uh, um, then, um, then that is what I would call pretending not to know something. And we know that bankers are really good at that. Um, you know the saying, I can see or hear or smell something that you don't see. So we, we have non-knowledge in our everyday life all the time. So we're playing with kids, but also in, in a very fundamental sense. And uh, 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 going a little bit further, we have the classical idea of the division of labor, right? Which is kind of a, a very important thing so we can survive in a complex society. So we know that there's people out there that know how, uh, how to do something, but we cannot do it. And that's what we know. So that's also a very important part of or it, it is a way of reframing what has been called the division of labor in a different way, right, in order to see several aspects which we may not have seen before. And the actions of other people in a very general way, right? So it often protects people. So it protects me right now that I don't know what you guys are thinking of me now, right? At least uh, that's what I'm guessing, right? So it's really good that I don't know that, otherwise I would feel insecure, etc. And recently, last 20, 25 years, we even have a right not to know when it comes to genetic testing. So that certain sets of knowledge, uh, uh, you can decide whether you, 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 you learn about them, right? Because if you learn that uh, on average, uh, you may die by the age of 57 because you have a strange disease that uh, or your, or your grandfather already had, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? You can go jogging, you can eat salad, you can live a vegetarian, whatever healthy life, but that's all you can do, know about that. Right? So that's the right for you not to know what type of diseases you may have inside. Right? And of course, there's a classical not wanting to, to, to know, and in the German and the English and other languages we have the saying, what you don't know does not hurt you. And 
increasingly so we know we can produce so much knowledge right in the sciences and academia but we render it unnecessary to know because it may not be useful right so knowledge for the sake of knowledge may have been a high um, a high and lofty goal in, 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 in the modern world through the course of the last 300 years in the sciences, but increasingly so we know uh, we, we need to focus on what is useful, whoever decides on what is useful and not useful. Right? And there's many other areas in the social world, in our everyday world, where we can reframe what we are doing on the binary distinction between the known and the unknown. And sometimes it's quite interesting because we see things differently based on that distinction and the different shadings of their distinctions, of course. Now, let's go to the idea of the growth of, non, uh, of, non, uh, of knowledge, and Daniela already mentioned that, that was rendered something very positive in a, in a general sense, and the intuitive claim and the intuitive promise of modernity was the more we know, the less ignorance is out there, right? But uh, we also know by now, and it's quite obvious, that the more we know, the more is on the horizon where we are getting aware of that we didn't know that we didn't know that beforehand. So the more we know, so too does our perception, hopefully, of what is unknown, right? And the idea is to categorize these types of non-knowledge on the horizon, if you want to uh, stay in that picture, um, uh, 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 and distinguish these so we can study them and can, can make uh, a research based on these types of decisions we make on certain types of non-knowledge. The crucial question is, and Daniela also mentioned that, does the unknown always have to be rendered negative? Now, if I phrase, frame the question like that, of course the answer is no, it doesn't have to be. From a sociological perspective, ignorance or non-knowledge is a very neutral term, right? It depends on on the perspective and it depends on what we're talking about, whether we evaluate that as negative or or, or, or bad or good, right? So what we all know in everyday life and the political realm is official rhetorics still trumpet uh, uh, safety uh, and certainty. That's kind of the, the high and lofty goal and science is supposed to produce true results, right? And if you don't know how to move forward, we have to be very, be very cautious. So depending on what interpretation you are using, the precautionary principle is exactly based on this idea, right? So that other people who have other interpretations of the precautionary principle, but I believe in, the, in, in most cases it is meant in this way, right? So if you don't know exactly what residual risks are there, um, um, then we should not move forward and wait for more knowledge, right? I'm overstressing it a little bit, uh, hopefully not trivializing it, but also in order to get my point across, I think that is kind of a, a nice, ideal, typical way of thinking. Now, in the real world, we know, right? Um, we walk down the street, we meet friends, that uh, we, we, we acknowledge ignorance. We often know that we don't know certain things, right? And we know that it may be better for the person I'm talking to you now uh, uh, that I don't tell him or her everything, right? In order not to hurt her. It doesn't have to be anything negative per se. It's kind of a normal thing and it's a question of politeness, etc. right? So there's very creative strategies that are cultural dependent, definitely, to successfully cope with non-knowledge and the surprises that are based on, on uh, 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 coping with non-knowledge, right? So here I threw in the term surprise. Um, why? Because I believe they somehow belong together. Because there is no surprise without uh, previous ignorance. So if you knew everything, you would not be surprised. And in many cases, I mean, you can certainly construct cases where this is not true, but in many cases, uh, no non-knowledge without at least a, a little surprise. So you need a surprise to become aware of what, you're, of what you do not know, right? So this kind of thinking along the lines of being surprised and becoming aware of what you don't know as a basis for further planning, for uh, building hypotheses in the sciences and simply becoming a social person and uh, 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 being a successful social person in that way that you find your way through society. Right. Um, let me say a few words on risk because a lot of people say, well, non-knowledge and ignorance, isn't that something that is inherited in the, inherited in the, 
in the notion of risk, and in many cases it is, right? Uh, you have, I don't know how many disciplines we have at, uh, in our university system, and ev each discipline has its own definition of what, what risk is, and in many cases uh, it, it means very different and very opposite uh, things are, that are opposing themselves. As, uh, for instance, risk as the potential of losing something of value. Right? This is a very general basic notion that doesn't have to be a quantified, uh, uh, doesn't have to be a, a quantitative look at the notion of risk, and several others. So in many cases, or in most cases, if you look at classical risk assessments, uh, and if you talk to engineers and uh, scientists, they want to quantify the world, and uh, uh, risk to them is when we know uh, the probabilities but if you know the probabilities, you need to at least have some data from previous events that you can use for computing these probabilities, right? I know for people, if, if there are risk assessors here in this room, they find this is oversimplified, but in order to bring across the point about the centrality of what is unknown, I think it is important to think about risk in a very broad and very a general sense as it has developed as a field of uh, risk studies in the last 40 or so years. Now the thing is, the point that I'm trying to bring across is that in what we call modernity, the modern world, we predict, we know things, we calculate, and then we act. It's kind of the ideal type, right? Something is tested in the laboratory, and when it has been tested in well enough, it's been released onto society. Right? We all know that this is uh, hardly ever the case, but ideal typically, this is the idea, right? Um, but whatever the de definition and whatever our, our idea of risk and safety is, risk assumes that there are experiences available that allow this calculation, right? And the unknown, ignorance is often neglected in risk assessment. It's crossed over with risk assessment sometimes, right? So what can we do here? Well, we can try, define and categorize the unknown to make it at least in hindsight, but sometimes also in real-time observation strategies, empirically at least a little accessible, right? Um, yeah. This slide here is just uh, to, to give you an, uh, kind of a, an idea where I'm coming from and where I got my, a lot of my ideas on the unknown from, and this is by a guy called Georg Simmel, a classical philosopher, a sociologist and also a philosopher, who wrote early on on the normalcy of, of the unknown. Let me, you don't have to read this, I'm, not, I'm running through that table uh, quickly. So secret as a classical notion of the unknown, I just mentioned that at the outset, uh, uh, is something that we would call, can call a regulation of the distribution of knowledge by creating and maintaining conditions of different types of knowledge gaps, if you don't like the term non-knowledge. So strategic non-knowledge in relations and personal relations is something uh, uh, very important, something that I just uh, mentioned when I talked about the everyday interactions and the normalcy of everyday interaction, right? And this is closely relinked to strategic non-knowledge in public, seating arrangements on trains, seating arrangements in buses, and how that has changed over the course of the last 115 years. Traveling in a coach uh, drawn by horses was a very different thing as regards politeness strategies and also strategies as regards what you want to know and you do not want to know. Right? So si sitting on a train, I came here with a train, so if people are picking the nose, you pretend you haven't seen that. I mean, most of us anyways, right? And uh, uh, that is very important in order to, to uh, keep the normalcy of everyday life, right? And uh, if you pick your own nose, you hope nobody has seen it, right? So you make sure nobody's watching, and if you realize somebody has, you're hoping that the person hasn't seen anything, etc., etc. So it's kind of a normal thing, and that may also change over, over time, but also uh, it, between different cultures. What may be most important to us here tonight is the not yet norm, because it has is, is been linked to, the, to uh, the, the way science is, is driven forward. And, uh, but definitely that can lead to, to negative end. 
uh, positive outcomes, right? In everyday life, you may uh, think about the adventure, about extreme sport events where you um, break free or break out of the normal course of life by doing bungee jumping in order to get that certain kick, right? But it's also a type of non-knowledge that you're moving into knowingly, right? otherwise it would be boring, right? Because uh, you, want, you want to get that kick, right? And that is kind of the thing where I, uh, that, I, that I also find very important in order to better understand the centrality of the unknown in everyday life. This is the last slide with definitions, promise. There's one thing, and you mentioned that before, the unknown unknowns who has been distributed after Donald Rumsfeld's uh, um, uh, 2002 statement. So historically, and f looking at the etymology at the, of the term, the word nescience, which in former times was rendered God's knowledge, knowledge we as human beings weren't even allowed to even strive for, right? But that is kind of a, uh, um, uh, an epistemic different class that at best we can know in hindsight. So we cannot know what we cannot know, and we cannot empirically access it, at least not as social scientists. Some brain researchers would say they can already detect uh, decisions made on not knowing in the brain before the person officially knows what he or she is doing. But this is very far ahead of, of, of proper research, but some brain researchers told me that. So I can run through that because Daniela already gave my talk, basically. Uh, general general non-knowledge, which I would call the very broad notion of ignorance, is the acknowledgement that some things are unknown, but they're not specified enough in order to do something. You know? You're surprised by something, you know, oh shit, I didn't know. The next step is you think it's important, right? Or it's not important. And that is where the notions of active and passive non-knowledge um, and positive non-knowledge come in. So known and specified ignorance used for further planning, right? Um, in science and hypothesis building, that is certainly uh, uh, very important. But also the negative side, the passive side, where you're afraid of, right? Where you, where, you, where you think, well, I'd rather not know that because I cannot patent it, I cannot sell it, or I may think about my partner in a bad way which I don't want to think about. So I'd rather not know, right? So these two terms, active and passive, or positive, negative, you can use other terms, is something we can empirically in the, with the methods we have as social scientists, at least try to register, right? So how do we do that? So if you see that, you think it's, it's, it's quite simple uh, and trivial, and it is, right? So when people say, well, I was ignorant of this or that, and there were knowledge gaps, and we just didn't know it's obvious, right? So you can register that in interview se sequences, etc. But also the utterance of surprise, which doesn't have to, have to be real words, uh, also points to previously unrecognized uh, um, ignorance or total ignorance, nescience, if you will, that people were totally unaware of something. But there's also broader lexical phenomena in everyday life, and you may, may want to read the papers with different eyes tomorrow morning, uh, uh, looking at these, at, at these terms so you can frame where actually what you read is somebody did not know anything, right? And you look at phenomena such as novel risks. Yeah, what is a novel risk? Right? Or unknown risks. I mean, you read these terms in the papers. If it's unknown, it's unknown, then it's not a risk. That's why I'm making this big story about risk, right? But in everyday life, we still talk about risk. But actually, in many cases, we know that people didn't know what they're talking about, right? Or something uh, is, uh, is not well understood yet, and we dealt with unreliable data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this all, always points to, to the unknown. And then we have um, uh, rhetorical figures such as moving into new areas or something is off the beaten track, etc. That also points to areas of the unknown that are used, hopefully, creatively and strategically. Right? I said I want to connect all this, uh, this whole shebang, with the notion of experiment. Right? And that is because this is called dis disruption lab, and the notion of disruption is very important in experiments too. And I think ignorance and surprise can be uh, integrated, conceptually integrated, with the, with the notion 
uh, of, ex of experiment because, to put it most bluntly, an experiment has been successful when it has failed in the sense that the hypothesis has turned out to be wrong, right? So the experimenter has worked successful when it turned out that the, 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 the hypothesis was wrong, so the, the experiment has been a failure, but it has been the basis to learn something new, to learn something interesting, to learn something fascinating, right? And this disruptive element in, the, in experiments uh, uh, um, is something that uh, um, is kind of counterintuitive at first, but in a lot of ways it has been trans formed and, and, and moved over to the, to the real world. But unlike in scientific experiments, my point here, in the lab, surprises outside, or experimental surprises outside the lab are normally not welcome. But still we talk about urban laboratories, uh, this place here is a disruptive laboratory, etc., etc. But what does it exactly mean? Is it just a term to, that has been used for something that has been there all along, or is it something new? It's kind of an open question, not a rhetorical one from my side. So, but there's many debates in, in uh, the last 20 years that refer to the increasingly experimental character of science as part of society. So that planning ahead in, uh, turns into a large scale or uh, real world experiment. Uh, and it also has to be seen of a longer term experiment that maybe we want to call, if we want to call that still, uh, modernity. Right? And uh, 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 so how can we usefully connect experiment, the unknown, and the element of surprise here? And there's a few foundations uh, in my memory. You see, I didn't know. I thought I had taken out that slide, but now it's there. So I'm surprised. I, I, I surprised myself. But it was a type of surprise that was possible. I'm not totally uh, shunned now and stunned, I mean, but uh, um, that's something uh, I have to run through quickly now because it's there. Right? I didn't know that before. I was absolutely certain I threw it out, but I didn't. Probably the train ride was too shaky or I'm too tired or whatever, right? So there's a lot of foundations on different notions of experiments. I'm not going to run through these, but one thing that a lot of people remind me of and say, well, but if you look in f into the founder of modern science, Francis Bacon, well, he had a clear notion of experiment. But that is probably not true. His most provocative proposal was uh, 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 that approval of the experimental method in science turns society itself into a large-scale experiment, right? It may be the fact that we all talk about experimental issues in the public and even in this room here may have to do with that notion of the unknown being used or attempted to be used creatively. Right? If you look into, uh, into the papers and book covers, uh, at least it seems to be like that. So you can even have your vacation in an experimental society when you don't know what people you are meeting on this island wherever you're flying to. So it's kind of a, a booming thing, but it leads to emptying out the notion of experiment in, in many ways. So it may not be a good thing after all. So let me give you a few examples from my own research too. Uh, uh, contaminated sites management and um, um, deep, uh, deep drilling strategies for, for geothermal heat. Um, in a lot of cases, when people uh, in uh, engineering offices, etc., clean up formerly contaminated sites, um, a lot of surprising things happen. I mean, the engineering company is doing wonderful work, uh, is doing test drills here and there, and then the bulldozer comes in and hits something, uh, and uh, 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 apparently something that wasn't known, right? And this tank here, filled with 12 tons of tar, would fill, uh, it would, if it was here, it would fill the whole room. Um, hadn't been detected by the best engineering companies we have in, in Europe, right? It's very difficult to get this type of knowledge, right, as an observer, as a social scientist, because a lot of people will be afraid to say, well, we actually didn't know, but it's a normal thing. So as a sociologist, it's not something that I use to accuse anybody because it's, it's, it's a normal thing, right? But the major challenge is in these types of cleaning up strategies in formerly industrial areas is that many contaminants are unknown, but it is known 
had something that contaminates are in the ground because you know a little bit of the history of the, of the industrial area, just a little bit. Right? But as always, decisions have to be made quickly so things can go wrong. And this is not a romantic idea of tinkering around that can be very dangerous, but still it has to be done. It's the only way to move forward in many ways. Right? Otherwise, um, uh, we have to, would have to stop the project. So the acknowledgement as a first step it's very dangerous in our thinking around risk, safety, certainty. The acknowledgement that things are unknown needs to become the norm. And in many fields, such as contaminated sites management, I would think it, it is a norm. Let me give you a quick run through an interview we've done many years ago. And I picked that for you guys from a representative of a state authority. And you know, state authorities in Germany, they either know everything they never make mistakes or they're not, they, they say we're not responsible. Right? There's these two ways. These guys here have been much more reflective in the sense of, of knowing what they are doing in the sense of creatively uh, including what has been unknown. Right? In such a complex situation, this guy who's a chemist by training tells us we cannot say exactly what type of measures we need in order to take action against these hazards. We just don't know. Right? And we didn't have a lot of beers after he told uh, this story, right? So very often you need that. You need to be very, you need to have a trust relationship with these people. And then you write up what you've found out and then they don't allow you to publish the whole thing after all because they're ashamed of it, right? So a lot of research has been done here. Um, basic research done by academic institution, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But, here. We still can't say exactly what's going on with the groundwater. And yet, and that's the important part, and that may also be transferable to other areas of social life, we need to do something. But what is our yardstick for doing something? This, the case of not knowing it, doesn't mean we can stop and wait for the risk assessment, because in many cases, p uh, cases the risk assessment has been done later on, after the fact which from a legal point of view, you shouldn't do, right? And that's why I would never give you the names as a, in the place where we've done that research because it's kind of a, a, a difficult issue to make this uh, public, right? The representative of the engineering office on the same topic says, well, sometimes there's no time left. Well, this is quite obvious. But they also say, and this is the, 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 the normalcy point I'm pointing to, but now all actors are used to the fact that in every abandoned industrial site, some unclarity remains. Not everything is documented. Let me put it this way. This container where I just showed you the picture from, perhaps it did not want to be documented. After all, it's amazing where these containers have been discovered. There are no documents about them. Now, the way to ionize this can also be uh, interpreted as it, an excuse, right? But if you get to know the whole scenery of contaminated sites management, you know that this is kind of a way of describing what cannot be avoided, right? You cannot avoid that uh, things can go wrong and that you're being surprised by what you encounter, right? Second example, geothermal energy drilling. No, the debate around fracking, etc. that's a different topic, but in a way, it may be comparable to that here. So the most humble drilling engineers, they say accessing geothermal heat is a very skill-intensive enterprise because knowledge of what to encounter down in the deep is hardly there. I mean, you need to go down there and know what, in, in order to know what is down there. So the geological modeling and the data you have for modeling is, is based on a very limited database because you don't know what's, what's down there 10 kilometers uh, uh, below, right? So the drilling engineer, one of the interviews we did, said as novel op options for resource use in the underground come up, novel risks have to be expected that are either not fully understood or are as yet unknown. It's rare that they use the term unknown in such an explicit way, but when they do, it's, it's nice to use these as pull quotes for presentations. Drilling engineer number two. There are not enough pre-explorations pre of local specificities available, but we need to move forward nevertheless. Now this sounds all irresponsible, 
But if you think about the real world, our everyday world, it's quite normal in, in, in many ways, right? We often don't know where to move forward, where to find our way, right? But our decision-making patterns are based on these types of intuition and, 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 and several other um, things that I'm going to talk about now. Now, even in a popular science book, because this is a pop popular presentation here, I checked the popular science book, you know, the dummy series that uh, uh, introduces about everything. So there's also a book called Alternative Energy for Dummies. And this guy, Rick de Gunther, the author, who is very favorable of, and very much in favor of uh, alternative or renewable energies, he said, locating suitable sites for geothermics in that case is more of an art than science. Right? That doesn't go down well with engineers and scientists, but probably it's more closer to the truth than a lot of people believe. And a lot of filling engineers are much more reflective than me, we may want to believe, and it's kind of, uh, 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 they would agree to that, right? Without feeling that this would undermine their, their authority, well, most of them. What do filling engineers say? Well, they say you often can't explain why and where you find heat. You have a rough idea, but when you actually find it, you're surprised nonetheless. And expecting the unexpected, that's everyday normality for us. And one guy even told it, it's instinct. Maybe there's a little irony in here, but in many cases, it, it, is, uh, it is the normality because the, um, the electronic devices on the trilling heads only work up to a certain temperature, 150 degrees Celsius, right? But it becomes interesting for producing energy, electricity, when it's much, much hotter down there. So you drill blindly down there. No, no other way to move forward. Is that irresponsible? Some people would say so. But from a sociological perspective, it's kind of a normal way of making decisions when you don't know, when you cannot know better, right? So, what are the challenges here? Knowledge production in what some people have labeled in um, experimental society. There's an increase, uh, increasing application pressure on science. We know that, right? So that means increasingly so, things that, uh, uh, will be tested, or the final tests will be undertaken in and with society, whether we like it or not. So we have to deal with the gap between the official rhetorics and real-world decision-making. That's what I meant by trumpeting safety versus the real world, the real world that we all live in. And the interesting part here is that this is probably less threatening as it may sound, that ignorance is readily apparent with different practitioner cultures, you know, with normal people like you and I but it is often denied in policy circles. A lot of civil society groups that it's kind of normal that you cannot know everything, right? And uh, uh, that is kind of the, the, the most difficult issue here to bring across, I believe. So if you communicate non-knowledge as a normality, normality uh, mistakes also take on a different meaning. So blame and finger pointing may, may also have become a, a different thing. But that may be something we need to get used to in the next 100 years, I guess. Right? So how could we do that? So I, haven't, I don't have a, a good answer to that, but we know from some of the stuff we've done, done research on that there's early legal agreements that sometimes explicitly include the unknown as a possibility. It was unthinkable 20 years ago, right? But sometimes that has been done. So when we do that and we take non-knowledge as a normality also in, not only in everyday life where we can laugh about it, right? But also in more difficult uh, areas, then as I just said, blame and finger pointing may have no target, right? The interesting thing is, and that is what I found most fascinating, when we did our research in contaminated sites management, that this did not undermine scientific optimism. Because a lot of people think if we show or if scientists clearly utter that they don't know certain things, they, they'll be uh, booed at, right? But at least the people we talked to, they said, well, um, it's quite the contrary that is happening, so we feel really freed from this pressure when talking to the mayor of the city, etc. 
uh, uh, to, so we can clearly also say what we do not know, right, in some cases. So that's kind of a normal thing and it may be a point to how science in public may change or may have to change in the, in the coming decades. And I guess that's it. Thank you. My self-promotion, but you already did a fine job, so here's the, here's the canvas. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting and very fast run through so, so many details, information and um, yeah, more, let's say, uh, complete overview over ignorance. Um, I think we've heard how normal ignorance actually is in daily life, which goes a bit um, in, or it stands in contrast maybe to what we, how we normally talk about it and also how we are educate, ed, educated to maybe um, understand ignorance or see ignorance. It normally has a very negative connotation, um, but it's much more normal than we think. Um, I mentioned in my introduction that it's actually a field of, it has become a field of study, ignorance, let's say. and. Um, but it's rather a new field of study. So ignorance is something so important or n so normal. How does it come that it has start or people have started to, to study it in, in these kind of very specific uh, terms only that late or since when? Maybe you can give us a little bit of a... Um, Overview of that. Well, it, uh, that's, that's kind of a crucial question. Is it an old field or, or a new field? It's probably as old as as human societies. I mean, Socrates' statement on that uh, he knows that he knows nothing or whatever, the, however that, uh, ever that has been translated into the English, is probably the first instance of what we today call ignorance studies, right? In theology, in all kinds of world religions, we have also debates on the importance of not knowing and, and the importance of silence connected to not knowing, etc., etc., right? But probably a lot of people felt um, uh, insecure, uh, using that as uh, the field of study in its own terms, right? So uh, um, when we pieced and puzzled together that handbook of ignorance studies, about every other week or every other day, uh, uh, my co-editor, Lindsay McGoy and I, came up with something new. Like, they're the fascinating brain researcher in Australia who's doing research on decision-making under situations of sample space ignorance, right? measuring brain areas, etc. And then we found this the theology guy in China who is doing this type of research. So we figured, well, there is a field called ignorance studies, but the people aren't aware of it. So we're trying to group all these people together and make a handbook out of it. Right? And I told this story to Joanna uh, earlier on, but the, since there is no field of ignorance studies, you cannot make a handbook out of it, because handbooks are there to um, to uh, present a field and present the state of the art of a, of a certain field, right? And we said, well, we in in invent a new field called ignorance studies um, by, by, by publishing a handbook. And the publisher, after some time at least, he went along, they went along with it. So it's uh, difficult to say why so late, but probably it's been there all along, but it wasn't grouped and integrated into, into a field. Right. In different disciplines, you've always had research on ignorance. Game theory, for instance, very important in economics, but it, it wasn't a major field for, for economics in general for a long time. Right? Um, yeah, so the, this, this handbook, it's, it's really extensive, so it's, it's very interesting to read also because you go through so many different areas and fields, and so you never get bored, let's say, or easily bored, because you, you, you change from one field to the next. Um, but in the end, as it addresses so many different fields and so many different um, research areas, who, who was the audience that you envisioned for, for this book? Who do you want to address with it? So, like, you know, where, where you, would you like to go with it? Well, firstly, I, 
I'm not, I'm not sure I ever thought about that, right? But probably, in, it, intuitively, it was an academic audience, right? Because in a lot of cases, I felt, even in my own writings from 10 years ago, there's some stuff where I thought, where, and by now I have to say, I reinvented the wheel. Because I simply wasn't aware of the literature that has been published in very strange places. I mean, you couldn't simply Google for it. So it wasn't intentionally that I was just lazy and, and, and ignorant, uh, not doing any research. But in, in, in many cases, we thought we, we need, we want to put as much as we can between two book covers so that people have a handbook in the classical sense so they see what a field is uh, doing in its, in its up-to-date version. But, interestingly enough, uh, we've, we, we received quite some attention. We have a full-length article in the New York Times and news clippings in Washington Post and a lot of European outlets as well. And that is something we didn't expect, but it shows that there's something, that there's interest in the unknown in a very neutral general sense, right? So our idea was, do, we, we just do yet another academic book, but then more became out of it, or so it seems. What were the, the most interesting or unexpected reactions uh, or from like, or where did you get most interest uh, with the book? Saying now that you are, when you tell that you had this kind of coverage and this kind of interest uh, also in the media? Um, well, most interesting, I found people that were asking for free PDF copies because they wanted to use it for their teachings, right? So teach ignorance. That was something, that, uh, the, probably a dozen courses in North America and, uh, um, and Europe are based on this handbook. Normally handbooks are not written for a student audience, but still, since there's nothing out there, people are using that. That was surprising in a, in a very positive sense. It also felt a little strange in a, in a certain way, but it showed that our intu intuition uh, to do that and convince the publisher, they weren't convinced Im immediately, and the reviews for our proposal were rather mixed, but still, uh, we, we convinced them after some time. That was probably the most positive thing. I mean getting some news clippings in, in prestigious dailies and weeklies just feels good. But it's not uh, surprising in the sense that any journalist uh, uh, got something out of it that, that we didn't know or that we felt. It, it just felt good. But the thing that it was used for teaching and that there's courses now called Ignorance 101 or something, that sounds, uh, was really good. Um, yeah, I have more questions, but maybe we can already open up uh, to the audience in case there's now slowly questions from your side. Don't hesitate to raise your hands and uh, jump in. Um, we already have. Please, please wait for the... the okay. How do you connect ignorance with the need of reducing complexity? I mean that can, can you say it again? Reducing complexity. That's what we all ask to do. In our personal life, as a society, we need to reduce complexity to, to be possible to act. And how is this for you connected, this concept of reducing complexity with ignorance and, on the other hand, possibilities? Well, I haven't thought about this question before, though I have to answer in a very ad hoc sense. Well, the example I gave at the outset, that it is very important that there are a lot of things out there that I should not know, like what you're thinking of me right now. So th this reduces the complexity in the sense of you and I interacting and communicating. Right? So in a lot of ways, and that's why, why we are we're keen on in our handbook also to call it ignorance studies and not with a, a clearly derogatory term such as agnotology or something like that. So it has a, a neutral sense because it can help to find your way through a very complex world in that sense. Not, in the, not, not complexity in the theoretical sense, but in the everyday meaning of a, a, a complex world. So that would be my ad hoc, my first ad hoc idea on how I think it could be related to the notion of complexity, right? There's one in the back. Okay. <laughs> the mic is coming. Um, so 
So I would like to know about um, the question of ignorance and no knowledge with, sorry, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. And um, with, uh, in relation to responsibility, responsibility in terms of um, the environment or political responsibility. So how uh, do these uh, terms combine? Responsibility and no knowledge. Thanks. Okay, let, let me repeat your, your question because I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but probably I did. Because if you kind of move forward the way I presented it here in the last 40 minutes, saying, well, it's kind of a normal thing um, that we don't know things and we, don't, we do it anyways, etc. Of course, we move into areas of irresponsible uh, tinkering. Right? The point that I'm trying, what I was trying to bring across is that this is true in many, many cases, and we need to have clear rules for that. Right? If you talk about experimenting, we need to make sure that uh, 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 there is no other way of finding out that, uh, 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 that piece of knowledge that we want to produce or there is no other way to move forward as regards finding new energy. And it also should be to the benefit of most uh, people involved, of the community involved, etc., etc. There need to be clear rules for that, right? But the thing I want to do, and that is difficult enough, but the thing I want to bring across is kind of the normalcy of what we're doing here, right? And then we can define rules and say, well, in some cases, not knowing may be the only way to move forward, right? And not stop there because we don't know everything. No, that needs to be decided upon in a hopefully democratically organized society or community. So the rules need to come from the people, they need to become from, from the crown, so to speak. But I think an awareness of the normalcy of uh, um, dealing with the unknown all the time, that is kind of the first step I would like to, to wave my flag for. First off, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to pull this question properly. Um, I'm from Mexico and uh, I work a lot with uh, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, I'm always grappling with this idea of alternative ontologies to explain and, of course, push ideas in the world. How, well, also, I haven't read your book or your handbook, so I, ap I apologize for that, but uh, hopefully... It's too expensive. I know. Go to the I, library. Yeah, well, well said. Thank you. Um, and perhaps this comment just relates to my overall uh, point, which is basically the matter of power in knowledge, which I was hoping that that was the center of the presentation, but it was much more uh, the whole framework of your work. Anyway, so my, my question is, uh, how are you engaging with this idea of um, ignorance and indigenous, uh, the indigenous knowledge? I don't want to uh, ask you about indigenous knowledge per se, but in this framework, uh, um, coming from the colonies in which basically indigenous knowledge was ignorance or was less uh, valid than the Western knowledge, uh, how do you engage with these ideas? Okay, the question is, um, let me re repeat it a little bit so to make sure that I answer your question is that there's been a lot of ignorance as regards indigenous knowledge and alternative forms of knowledge because Western science, for instance, was rendered better, right? That, that's not what you were asking for, but it's kind of what I'm thinking of when I hear, hear indigenous knowledge and, and, and the importance of indigenous knowledge. Is that what you're, you're aiming at? It's just the, the element of power in exactly. both ignorance and yeah. knowledge. Yeah. And especially, yeah. well, I'm really interested in hearing how, how do you engage with colonial uh, um, ideas of, or post-colonial ideas of knowledge and ignorance. Yeah. Do, I, do, I, do I engage in that? So it's kind of a, 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 a different topic, but I mean, it's important to see and that you that not only knowledge is power, but also different times of, 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 of ignorance and also ignoring certain sets of knowledge, right? And render them less useful, right? And that is kind of, uh, should be part of, of ignorance studies as well. So if there's a second edition of the handbook, I hope you can contribute to that, right? Yeah. 
I think there was also, <coughs> as we said, not everyone has access immediately to the book, but it reminds me of the, there's one essay by Charles Mills, I think, exactly. who's talking about white ignorance, yeah. and that's going in that direction. Yeah. So there's part of the book is, or one chapter of the book is dealing exactly with that question of um, how colonialism and uh, European uh, uh, influence in the West, uh, like Western thought influenced um, non-Western knowledge and uh, knowledge production. Thank you, I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> you just forgot. Yeah, um, I wanted to... Ah, this is bad, okay. Um, from your talk, I could misconstrue a certain reading that could really think of ignorance in an, let's put it, an enabling, legitimizing the place of ignorance within pursuit of certain goals or Absolutely. gains. So you said you got a lot of uh, attention, uh, more mainstream attention than you expected. So I was wondering if within this attention, uh, you, uh, if, you, if your um, research has been maybe misconstrued, if it was properly or improperly depicted in a way which was politicized to one direction or the other. Um. That's an extremely important question. I haven't thought about that. But basically, I mean, if you look at our handbook, right? I, I, I was trying to level out the, the, the course of talks here at this, at this meeting. If you look at a handbook, probably three quarters of them look at the dangers of misconstruing things. White ignorance, Charles Mills chapter. So for journalists, it probably would be, or for the mainstream media, it would be difficult to move our handbook into one or the other direction, right? It would more be in the classical um, stream of ignorance studies, where we, other the case studies in the book show how um, journalists have been misled by industrialists and have spread certain types of knowledge which was utterly nonsense, uh, etc., etc., right? But from a sociological perspective, it should be leveled out. So different types of non-knowledge should be on equal footing in the sense of that the same strategies and the same interests are behind that, right? For unsavory goals in many times, we should not forget that. But from a purely analytical point of view, I want to raise awareness to the normalcy. So I would say so far so good, um, it has not been misused by any uh, political extremist uh, stream. And I think it would be really difficult to do so because my talk is not in the book, right? My talk was for you guys here. And uh, that's why I don't think um, it can be used for as an excuse in many cases, right? The danger is there. It's clearly there, right? But we should be aware of that, right? In order to use it constructively, in order to, to deal with it in a, in a responsible manner. Right? Um, I would suggest we take one last question because as usual, we're running out of time and to not stress it too much. Yes. Let's give the last. There was a comment because I found the really, there was another one. There was another okay, one. so maybe That's we do two. <laughs> Two short ones. Too short. No, I mean, it's uh, like an answer to a, que a question actually that you pose because you were wondering in which way we use the term disruption here. And I found really interesting that you are connecting uh, uh, the idea of ignorance with the one of... Um, uh, a lot of things that we don't know, maybe it allows us to kind of hand over the power to the ones who know. In this case, like, it's a... Uh, it's the science world, so it is the science that is bringing the new paradigm. And also it makes me think that when Humboldt is not accepting students for masters who want to study existentialism, rather they would like to teach analytical right. philo uh, philosophy, that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thanks, that's a great question. I mean, I don't, I mean, the. the the notion of paradigm shift has been overused, 
right? And we, nobody here in this room, I would say, is in a position to say whether we are on the edge of something. People say that, well, we have an epochal shift, epochal shift based on whatever, you name it. I don't think we can do that. In hindsight, our grand-grandchildren may be able to, to make a judgment about uh, this day in, in late September 2016, whether it was kind of the beginning of, of a paradigm shift. I don't think so. I cannot say that, right? Maybe, maybe you're right after all. But one thing where I believe uh, you may be wrong is that science in the classical sense will be those in the know. Quite the contrary. I think different types of knowledge production from indigenous knowledge to all kinds of experiences that people have will become more important, right? And will, will gain an importance that will not undermine hopefully, the authority of science. Without science, we cannot do most things, but it's just one part of the picture. And that will be increasingly the case because ignorance studies, the way I approached, developed out of science and technology studies. So a lot of the scientists that have been studied by social scientists in the last 30 years uh, uh, clearly said, well, actually, we don't know. But we're not allowed to say that because the outside world expects us to come up with a clear result, a number, 27, right? But actually, if they were like honest, they would say, well, it's between 5 and 35. Well, let's say 27 because that's what the policy maker wants to hear. So I don't think we should worry about science being the only source of knowledge production. Increasingly so, it will be other alternative forms of knowledge making and knowledge production. And I'm pretty sure Joanne is going to talk about that in a minute. Maybe not. She's nodding a little bit. So at least a little bit she's going to talk about that. I right? think, yeah. Okay. Perfect, thank you very much. I think that's a good point to end and make people curious about what Joanna will <laughs> actually talk <laughs> and tell us about in the, in the next panel. We will have a short break of um, about 15 minutes and yeah, please come back, stay and uh, we'll continue.